Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, hey everyone, welcome to another episode in our daily study of the 366 Key Chapters of the Bible. Today is episode 78, where we are reading about when Solomon built the temple and then dedicated it to the Lord. We have a lot to cover in this section, and we've skipped over a fair amount, so let's get you caught up. Back in chapter 2, you'll remember, David dies and Solomon becomes king. In chapter 3, Solomon asks the Lord for wisdom to lead his people. Well, the Lord answers Solomon's prayer. We didn't read this section, but going into that, the Lord answers Solomon's prayer, gives him wisdom, and gives him blessings. For instance, back in chapter 4, verse 20, it says that Israel and Judah were as numerous as the sand of the seashore, just that many people there. And then in verse 25, it says they could live in safety under their own vine and fig tree. Just this idea that they could be out in their front yard, their backyard, not having to worry about marauders coming in and just kind of do anything to them. So everything is going so well in the kingdom that Solomon can turn his focus to building the temple. Now you'll remember that David had wanted to build the temple, but the Lord had said no because he had blood on his hands. The Lord told him that his son would build the temple. And so David accepted this, was okay with it, but he wanted to be heavily involved. And so he wrote the blueprint for it. He gathered much of the materials for it. He even gave from his own personal treasury to fund the building of the temple. And he called the rest of his fellow Israelites to follow his example. And so all of that groundwork has already been laid. And so here we are. Solomon's been king for about four years. Everything's been going really well. And so in chapter 5, Solomon basically puts in a purchase order for some wood from King Hiram of Tyre. And he wants just to begin building the temple. So the temple begins somewhere around 967 BC. And we might wonder, well, why do they even need to build this temple? After all, they've got the tabernacle. Why go through such an expensive thing as this temple? Well, that's because there's really big differences between the tabernacle and the temple. The tabernacle was designed so they could be easily set on up and carried around and transported. It was basically this um, this tent-like structure. had this wooden frame on the inside. It was about 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. It basically consisted of two main rooms. There was the holy place and the holiest of holies. In the holy place, there was this uh, sacred bread there, a golden lampstand, an altar of incense. All of that was just dedicated to the Lord. And then behind that was another room, the holiest of holies, which would contain the ark of the covenant, which would just symbolize the presence of the Lord. Now, the temple was kind of similar to the tabernacle, but also a lot bigger and a lot more permanent. The temple was about 90 feet long, about 30 feet wide, about 45 feet tall. Not only that, there was all kinds of extra stuff that was built around it, so it was just much, much larger. It was built even in a specific location. It was on Mount Moriah, which is the same place where Abraham went to offer Isaac back in Genesis 22. This is a sacred temple on a sacred mountain. This temple took seven years to build, and chapter 6, verse 7 says it was made without hammer or chisel or any iron tool, so there was no sound. The inside stone was covered with kind of panels of wood that had all this beautiful carvings of cherubim and palm trees and flowers on it. The floor and the doors were overlaid with gold. It was just this beautiful sight to behold. In the inner chamber, you have these cherubim that were over the ark. And these cherubim were these, um, they're basically angels. And they're made out of wood, covered in gold. And they have these long wings that then would just stretch towards one another. They'd be on either side of the room. They would stretch towards each other and just kind of be over the ark. And these weren't small. These were 15 feet high and 15 feet wide. So just these massive angels there. You can imagine, it was this beautiful structure. It was a structure dedicated to the Lord. Now, all of this took seven years for Solomon to build, and so it started in roughly 967 BC, finished it roughly around 960 BC. And so that brings us all to chapter 8. Chapter 8 opens with Solomon calling the leaders together for this grand ceremony of dedication. They are going to be bringing the ark into the temple for its permanent home and just dedicating all of this to the Lord. Well, that all happens at the opening few verses of chapter 8. And then in verse 10, as the priests are bringing the ark into the holy place, that's the first chamber in the temple. And as they bring this ark there, the glory of the Lord appears to them in a cloud. And this just is his way of approving of this new temple. He does something very similar when they built a tabernacle back in Exodus 40. And so when Solomon sees this glory of this Lord, this just radiant light, he just rejoices. And so standing by the altar of the burnt offering, Solomon offers this glorious prayer of dedication. He starts by recounting God's faithfulness to his people and his faithfulness to his promises to David, his faithfulness in all things. 
He says in verse 27 that the highest heavens cannot contain the Lord, much less this temple. He's fully recognizing, God, you're way more glorious than this temple, and we just want to praise you and recognize that. And yet, he's also establishing that this place, the temple, is the place where people can gather to pray and seek him. And so then he starts to just unfold just what kind of prayers might be offered by his people there. He asked that the Lord would hear the prayers of his people. He asked that when they would seek him, he would hear them and forgive them, that he would guide them to walk in his ways and walk in his righteousness so that they would just find his blessings of forgiveness. And then he makes several connections about the people's faithfulness and God's blessings upon them. In verse 35, he talks about the Lord withholding rain because they have sinned and that the people would recognize this and that they would repent and call upon him and that he would teach them in the right way to go. In verse 37, he talks about how there might be a famine or pestilence or sickness. And in verse 38, the person acknowledges that there's an affliction, there's a sickness even in their own heart. And Solomon asked the Lord would hear their prayers of confession and repentance and forgive them. In verse 39, Solomon declares that God alone knows the hearts of all men. He just knows what's in our heart. And he continues to pray this way, just with this theme of acknowledging that sin produces broken fellowship with God, which produces pain, and that people will recognize this, and they will call upon God with hearts of repentance, asking him to cleanse them of their sins. And when you look through this passage here, 14 times the word prayer appears, as Solomon is just expecting this temple to be a house of prayer. 10 times the word sin occurs. It even says in verse 46, there is no one, no man who does not sin. And so Solomon is expecting this temple to be a place where men can deal with their sins and have them cleansed and removed. Two times in this passage, the word confess occurs. That's just a simple acknowledgement of our sins. It's this idea of recognizing, yeah, God, I know you know this is a sin. I'm now recognizing it's a sin as well. Four times the word turn or repent occurs here, just demonstrating that when we recognize that we're doing something that is sinful, we're seeing that it is foolish, it is folly to do our own way, and we're repenting and coming back to the way of the Lord. Five times the word forgive appears in this passage, asking God to restore fellowship with these repentant sinners, just asking for forgiveness. And so Solomon's whole point in this whole passage here is that when God is working among his people, when he is present with them, they'll be walking in his ways and following him. When they turn from that, and when they move away from the presence of God and pursue a path of sin, they will increasingly be walking down a path of judgment and of pain and sorrow and suffering. They need to repent of that and come back to the Lord. And so this whole passage here is just this great prayer of Solomon's to the Lord, and it's really a model prayer for us just to seek God as well. One of the reasons why this is a key chapter is because it shows us that not only do we need to have our sin removed, and not only does our sin create all kinds of unintended consequences, but most importantly, this shows us the need for Christ's work on the cross. Because everything that's going to happen in this temple now for all this time, all of the works, all of the sacrifices, all of the worship, all that stuff is only made effective because of Christ's work on the cross a thousand years later. If you were to turn in your Bibles over to Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, that whole passage there is just talking about how we have all sinned and how ultimately God was overlooking this sin looking forward to the cross. It says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This, and here's where it gets key, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. How could he pass over them when all these sacrifices being offered? Because the sacrifices were just showing the people's true faith and trust in God, that he's a God of forgiveness, and God could be a God of forgiveness because of the cross. Hebrews 10.4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Hebrews 10.10 says, By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so Christ's work on the cross wasn't just for the people who who would believe after the cross. It would extend backwards to those who believe beforehand as well. Likewise, we see in this passage here that God is not bound by heaven or hell, let alone a temple. That means we don't go to a specific place to worship God as though we couldn't worship him somewhere else. Jesus told the woman in Samaria in John 4, 21, He said, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Why? 
Well, he says in verse 23, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now, there might be people who say, well, I can worship God all I want without even without Jesus. No, we need to have our souls cleansed. We need to have our sins removed. That's all by the work of Christ's cross. But once Christ's cross is applied to us, once that sin is removed, we can then actually truly worship God and celebrate him. And so we can worship God anywhere. Whenever God's word is open, whenever it is followed, whenever he is praised based on truth, that is legitimate worship, whether it's in our home, our car, or a park bench, anywhere. We're going back to chapter 8. When Solomon is finished with his prayer of dedication, he then offers this massive sacrifice to the Lord of 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. These are just numbers we really can't wrap our minds around. Obviously, it's just this massive sacrifice going on here. And then in all of this, the people are just celebrating. They have this feast that lasts for two weeks. They go back to their homes joyful, just excited about the goodness of the Lord that he had shown to David and to his people Israel. And so you just got this great celebration and this great dedication going on here. Now, this passage has so much in it. There's so much food for our souls here. It's really hard to boil it all down into a couple points of application. And so as you can see, as we go through it, you've got all kinds of stuff. You've got uh, dealing with confession. You've got just praising God for his, his greatness, his glory, the fact that he is in all places at all times. You have just this opportunity to just come to the Lord and just call upon him for mercy and forgiveness. We have just this reminder here that we can worship God anywhere. There's so many great things in this passage we could already worship God for. I would just recommend, as we finish out this time, why not go back through this passage and just kind of read through and just think about how it relates to your own life. And anything that just strikes you, convert that to the Lord as prayer. Repent of the things you need to repent of. Praise God for the things you're seeing about Him. Celebrate Him for His presence and His work in your life. Knowing in all of this that you serve a God who walks with you, who wants to abide with you, who wants to lead you, and will even forgive you when you walk off that path. He'll bring you back and he'll accept you back when you come back to him in repentance. And so with that, so good to talk with you today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.